Good morning, Circleville Christian Church. We are virtual this morning, mainly just because Jackson County cases are on the rise. We want to err on the side of caution and keep everybody safe, but uh, we're just ripping around back to what we did earlier this spring. So we ask that this morning you go ahead and just uh, sing with us as we begin our worship service this morning in song. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art, thou my best thought.
communion, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Well, we thank God for Jesus, broken for us as the bread symbolizes. This one who was broken is the same Jesus who earlier stood among hungry people and calmly and assuredly broke five loaves to feed 5,000 people. We picture him there, looking into the heaven, thanking God, breaking the bread, and giving it away to a hungry crowd. We see that miracle bread as beautiful, perfect loaves, for God created it. But its value was not in the beauty, but rather in the brokenness, for it was the broken bread that met the needs of the hungry. When Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice, he prayed, not as I will, but as you will. This was his final and complete giving of himself to be broken for us. The loaf was costly, yet adequate to meet every spiritual need. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the day that you've given us. We thank you now for this time of communion. We thank you for Jesus, the bread of life, for he is our perfect example of total submission. And I just pray, Lord, that you will shape us, 
and break us again and again so we can be used to feed the spiritually hungry around us. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Circleville. What's going on? My name is Ben Field, and I am the Director of Admissions at Manhattan Christian College. And I'm going to be sharing the word with you all this morning. I was really excited to, to be with you all, but uh, due to the pandemic, uh, we will be having church online today. Uh, but before we get started, I, I just want to say I'm praying for you. Hope that you're staying healthy, staying safe during this time. And also, I want to say thank you for your support of Manhattan Christian College. It's because of partners like you that we're able to continue in our mission of educating, equipping, and enriching Christian leaders to change the world for Christ. Uh, we can't do it without you. We're so grateful, and I hope to be able to see you all in person someday soon. Uh, let's pray, and then we will dive into God's Word together. Father in heaven, thank you for this day, for this opportunity that we have to connect uh, virtually and to hear your word, to study your word, and, and to seek your face, Jesus. God, I, I pray for anyone who's sick, uh, who's not feeling well, God, that you would heal them, that you would protect them, and that we would all be able to be a great encouragement and support to each other during this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, I want to ask you the question, what is it that brings you joy? What are some of the things in your life that just bring a smile to your face? I was thinking about that. I was making a list of some of the things that, that bring me joy, that make me smile. And here's a few things that I came up with. Uh, number one, puppies. Puppies bring me joy. There's something about a little puppy that, that just, you can't help but smile. Another thing that makes me smile is, is my niece, Elsie. And she's 18 months old, and she is just a doll. I love any time that I can spend with my niece, and she brings me so much joy. As a matter of fact, her middle name is Joy, too. Another thing that brings me joy is uh, whenever you're able to watch your favorite sports team. Um, so for me, that's watching the Kansas City Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes. I also enjoy watching the Kansas Jayhawk basketball. Those are things that bring me joy. And I was thinking about all these things that bring me joy. It brings me joy to preach. It brings me joy to spend time with friends and family. It got me thinking, what is it that brings God joy? What is it that makes God smile? It brings God joy when the prodigal son comes home. In Luke 15, 7, uh, Jesus was just talking about a shepherd who has 99 sheep and he leaves them all to find the one that is lost. And when the lost sheep is found, this is what he says. In the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. It brings God joy when, when families that have been through hardship and division give way to forgiveness and grace and reconciliation. It brings God joy when, when Christians show the love of Christ to those who are on the margins of our society. To those who are poor and struggling and needing help. There are a lot of things that bring God joy. And this morning we're going to look at another thing that brings him joy. Found in Matthew chapter 9. If you have your Bible this morning, I hope that you will open it up to Matthew chapter 9. Beginning in verse 39. I'm glad to be with you virtually. And hope that this study of God's word will be beneficial to you and your walk with Jesus. Matthew 9, 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Here we see three things that Jesus always did throughout his ministry. Number one, he was a teacher. Wherever Jesus would go, he would teach people about God. Back then, very much like today, there were so many people that had misconceptions about God. And Jesus came to show us and to teach us what God is really like. Number two, he was a preacher. He's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. 
The news that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And no matter how far gone you feel you are, Jesus wants us back to come home and welcomes us in open arms. He's preaching that he can make all things new and that the kingdom of God is at hand. And number three, he was a healer. And so these are three things that Jesus did throughout his ministry. He was a teacher, he was a preacher, and he was a healer. Wherever he went, he would heal people. He would heal every disease and every sickness. If Jesus were around today, he would wipe out all the hospitals and everyone would be able to go home and be healthy. Now, as a people today, as, as Christians in America, we can teach others and, and we can preach. Some people have that gift, but, but we can't heal like Jesus did. We can't heal, but we can help. And so as Christians, we need to be on the lookout. Hey, where are ways that I can serve other people? What are ways that I can show the love of God to those in my community, those in my family, that might need a little help during this really hard time during 2020? Let's go to verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. There are a couple things that we need to notice here. And the first is that Jesus sees the crowds. Jesus doesn't put on his headphones and ignore the pain and suffering of those that's happening all around him. He didn't turn a blind eye to the vulnerable or to the wounded faces in the crowd. He didn't view broken people as an inconvenience. He viewed them as the reason he came to earth in the first place. And I need to tell you this morning, if you're watching, if you're listening, if you hear my voice, Jesus sees you. You might be sitting here and you feel all alone and you feel unwanted. And this has maybe been the hardest year in your life. And I want you to know that Jesus sees you and he cares. The God who created the whole world, the stars in the sky, he sees your pain. He sees what's stressing you out and he's compassionate towards you. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe there's a family member that's really, really sick. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, Jesus sees you, he loves you, and he cares. And I'm certain that there are people at this church, at Circleville Christian Church, that would love to connect with you and talk with you about the God who is there, who sees us and loves us in the midst of our pain. Jesus saw the crowds and was filled with compassion for them. The message translation says that he looked at the crowds and his heart broke. It doesn't say he saw the crowds and he was annoyed. Or he saw the crowds and he was irritated. No, he saw the crowds and his heart breaks for them. I want to tell you this morning about the worst sermon I ever heard. And maybe this will get you thinking about the worst sermon you've ever heard too. Hopefully it's not this one right now. When I was in high school, we, my church youth group, we went on a weekend retreat. And the speaker was going to speak on the evidence for the resurrection. And that's a layup, right? If you're a preacher and you're supposed to speak on evidence for the resurrection, that's something that the, the ball is set on the tee. All you got to do is knock it out of the park. So here he is, this man stands up in front of probably a hundred high school and middle school students. And the first thing he says is, I hate stupid people. I'm sure that guy is a blast to hang out with. He went on to talk about how if you didn't believe in the resurrection, that you were stupid and that he pitied you. That's not a great evangelism strategy. Because this guy, this preacher that I heard way back in high school, he viewed lost and broken people with condemnation when Jesus views lost and broken people with compassion. Jesus views us with compassion. And we need to see other people how Jesus sees them. In the fall of 2016, I went to a church leadership conference uh, with some friends of mine. The conference was in Dallas, and it was a really great time for for everyone who went. And during the conference in the evenings, we had our evenings free, and so the the Cubs were in the World Series, and so we went to a restaurant, and we're watching the game. And as we begin to watch, I, I turn to my friends, and I say, hey, we need to go somewhere else. 
Like these TVs are blurry. This is a terrible picture. Uh, we, we can't stay here for the game. And my friends look at me and they said, what, what are you talking about? The TVs are fine. And my friend Bert, he took his glasses off and he handed them to me and he said, hey, try these. And I put them on and oh my goodness, I could see life in HD again. The problem wasn't with the TV, it was with me. My vision was blurry. I wasn't seeing things accurately. And if we view people as a nuisance or as an inconvenience or as merely annoying, our vision is blurry. We're not seeing the way God wants us to. We're not seeing the world through the eyes of Christ. And Jesus is filled with compassion. Why is he compassionate towards them? Because they're harassed and helpless. They're like sheep without a shepherd. They're worn out. They're tired. They're trying to do life on their own, and it's not working out. And I think we get ourselves in a lot of trouble when we view people who are lost and in need of a Savior as an inconvenience rather than as sheep without a shepherd. If you've grown up in the church or you've been going to church for a while, you've probably learned that, that sheep aren't very sharp. They're not the smartest animals. And it, what would happen if sheep were left to their own devices? We, we don't even want to know because it would not go well. It would be like if you left your house for the weekend and you, you put a toddler in charge. It's not going to go well for you. Jesus doesn't look out at the sheep and say, I hate stupid sheep. No, he, he loved them and he loves us too. Let's go to verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We have two sermon points today. So if you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to write this down. Point number one, ask the Lord to send workers. I think God has way more in store for us than we even realize. And a lot of times, I think we don't tap into it because we don't ask. Why is it that our churches aren't growing? Why is it that our Bible colleges aren't busting at the seams? A lot of times, it might be because we just don't ask. In the book of James, it says, you have not because you ask not. Oh, we strategize and we'll read books on church growth. And at the Bible college, we have classes on how to be effective church leaders and how to make a difference and how to lead a ministry. But it's all worthless if we're not asking God to send workers into the harvest. E.M. Bounds said that the church is looking for better methods while God is looking for better men. Please get this. Strategizing is important. But if you're not willing to put in the hard work of praying to God and being in solitude before Him and pleading with Him and crying out to Him, if, if we're not willing to pray, we're wasting our time. God is looking for men and women of prayer, men and women who love Jesus and care about his mission so deeply that they are dedicating their entire lives to it. That doesn't mean that all of us are in full-time vocational ministry, but, but all of us are called to ministry. Wherever it is that you live, wherever, whatever it is that you do, our call as Christian people is to be on mission with Jesus and to share the good news of the gospel. What if prayer wasn't something that we did just at the beginning of a meeting or before a meal, but it was something that we truly devoted our time to? Well, what if we went to God in prayer as our first instinct rather than our last resort? Jesus is telling us to ask. So let's ask. Jesus said that without him, we can do nothing but far too often our lives reflect us trying to do ministry, trying to do life without Jesus. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 is one of my favorite passages in all of the scripture. I'll read it to you now. 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. He can do more than we ask or imagine. But we've got to ask. Circleville, will you commit to praying with me for God to send workers into the harvest? Will you spend some time every single day, add it to your prayer list to pray for God to send out people that are going to make a difference for him, to send out workers into the harvest field? Will you add it to your daily prayer list? And if you don't have a daily prayer list, what better time to start one than now? To make a list of things that you will intentionally and purposefully pray through every single day of your life. Plead with God to give you opportunities to share the gospel. And when you get those opportunities, take them. Point number one was, was to ask the Lord to send workers into the harvest field. Point number two is to get to work. If you're watching with your family, I want you to repeat after me. Get to work. Someone once said that if you love what you do, you will never work a day in your life. And that person obviously never did any ministry. Listen, I, I love ministry. I've dedicated my life to that. But, but if you've ever done ministry for longer than 30 minutes, you know that it is work. It's hard. It's a grind. It's messy. But, but there is nothing greater that any of us could ever do with our life than working for and abiding in Jesus. The harvest is plentiful. Sometimes we think that just because we live in America and that there are churches on every corner that, that we must be doing pretty good. I'm from Tonganoxie, Kansas, and that's a small town in between Lawrence and in Kansas City, and in that area, you see churches all over the place. In Kansas City, there are churches everywhere. You can't drive more than a few blocks without seeing a church on every corner or a sign for a new church plant. But I want to put things in perspective just a little bit. Kansas City has 2.2 million people in 12 counties in the metropolitan area. Of those 2.2 million people, 24% claim an affiliation with a local faith community. 1.7 million people don't. 1.7 million people in the Kansas City area don't claim any affiliation with a church. One out of four do, but that doesn't mean that they're passionately following Jesus. It just means that they checked a box on a survey. The survey says that 11% of people participate at least once a month in a local faith community. What that means is that 2 million people in the greater Kansas City area aren't connected to a local church at all. That's staggering. The, the fields are ripe for the harvest. And I know those stats are for Kansas City, but I think that's pretty indicative of where our country is as a whole. We have an unbelievable opportunity in front of us. Your view of the harvest is going to be predicated on your perspective. You're either going to say something like, there's so much to do. I don't even know where to start. I'm just going to take a nap. Or your eyes are going to light up. And you'll be filled with, with this unspeakable joy because you are armed with the message of the gospel in a world that is so desperate for hope and desperate for purpose. The fields are ripe for the harvest. Where are you working? Who in your life are you spending time with that is far from God? Are you involved in a church? Are you actively participating in the mission of Jesus? Are you living your life every single day with the cause of Christ at the front of your mind? This goes for all Christians. This isn't just for MCC students or pastors 
or professors. It's for all who follow Christ. If we're going to call ourselves Christian people, but we only hang out with other Christians, we are not participating in the mission of Jesus. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That's his mission. That's why he came to earth. And if you don't have people in your life that you're trying to reach with the gospel, you're not living the way that Christ wants you to. I'm not here to guilt you this morning, but, but to encourage you. If you haven't been working for the harvest, it's time to get to work. Let's be a people that bring God joy. Let, let's be a people that share the gospel with those in our lives who don't have a relationship with Jesus, who don't follow him. Let's see lives change for eternity. Let's ask God to move in ways like we've never seen before at Circleville Christian Church, at Manhattan Christian College, and in believers all around the world. And may he get all the glory. Because whenever the lost is found, whenever someone comes to know Jesus for the first time and they're baptized, that brings God so much joy. The angels rejoice in heaven and God wants us to partner with him and be on mission with him. Eternity hangs in the balance. Let's ask the Lord to send workers into the harvest and let's get to work. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Circleville Christian Church. I thank you for their love and their passion for you. I thank you for their partnership with MCC. God, I pray for them right now in the midst of this pandemic and the health crisis that our country is currently in. I pray that if anyone in the congregation is sick, that you would heal them, that they would give you the glory. God, I pray that this would be a church that pleads with you to send out workers for the harvest and is getting to work as well. I pray that Circleville would be passionate about reaching their community with the gospel of Jesus Christ and that you would move like they've never seen before and that you would get all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When my hope and strength is gone You're the one Thank you, everybody. Have a great week.